О, о, красавчик. Все, уже подали. Все, благодарим фонд и спасибо за то, что помогаете нам не мерзнуть, когда мы стреляем в кацапов. Спасибо. In a world that seems to be losing its way, we search for inspirational people and stories, hoping to find traces of our future. This is Backlight. Welcome to the world of freedom fighters. The border between East and West, between Russia and NATO, between a democratic West and an authoritarian Russia is right here exactly in the middle of the river Narva, which separates Russia and Estonia. When the invasion of Ukraine began a year ago, this freezing cold water suddenly became fraught with tension. Because the river Narva is also one of the northeastern borders of NATO territory. If even the slightest thing goes wrong here, we in the Netherlands will also be formally at war. Article 5 states that an attack on one NATO member is an attack on them all, and that includes the Netherlands. <laughs> Eesti piirivalve, palun teie dokumentid. Paruski, Pastonski, Paruski. And now that China is also taking up an active role in this conflict, this war is increasingly developing into a conflict with global dimensions. And although the front is far away, the conflict is coming closer to us too. Latvia, Litva, Estonia, Moldova. Далі буде Грузія, далі буде Польща, і так будуть вони йти до Берлінської стіни. How does it feel to be slowly sucked into a war you never wanted? A war that creeps towards your borders day by day. The Estonians know all about that. They're a NATO member and they've joined the European Union, but nonetheless there is a constant sense of insecurity. In 2008, uh, Russia attacked Georgia. Uh, then after that was uh, Crimea, was Donbas. Every next step is bigger because uh, they were not punished for this. So if we don't send a clear signal, then it will just continue. Ever since the invasion of Ukraine, Estonians have been wondering what will I do if one day Russia turns up on our doorstep? Will I flee? Will I fight? Will I offer help in whatever way, shape or form? Many people maybe don't want to realize, but uh, it's uh, Ukrainians are not only fighting for their freedom, uh, they are fighting for all of Europe's freedom. And um, if people can't comprehend that, then um, I think we have a bit of a problem on our hands. What would you do if it came to the crunch? Flee? Fight? Or help out in any way you can? bridge between Russia and Estonia is still open. But the atmosphere in the town of Narva is tense. It's partly because almost 90% of the population are ethnic Russians, brought here by Stalin in the 1950s to settle. This situation is reminiscent of the Donbass region. At the moment, everything seems quiet. 
but only a few miles away in the hinterland, NATO troops are ready. How fast can you get in action if necessary? If you see, we are ready to do it now if needed. We are already prepared and uh, we just practice it. So you could do it tomorrow? Process. Yes, we can do it tomorrow. We can do it today if needed. How many hours do you have if you need to act? How many hours I need? How many hours we need to get to the position from this location? Just a few hours. They say that the next war in Europe has already started, but its escalation demands, then of course, if needed, we will be ready to also support Ukrainians in direct way, not only sending the weapon system. But, but this means escalation and this is a different story. And that means that maybe we will see the next big war covering not only Europe, but the rest of the world as well. What are you defending? We are defending the Western values. This is very simply saying. But as a nation, we will be fighting for the survival. And we understand this one. We know that if the Russians attack Estonia, it's not about just losing the territory. I think they will wipe out the Estonians as the nations from the world. And we will just fighting for the survival, which makes our life very easy. We don't have nothing to lose. We have just something to win. And that's very simple. And that's why we are maintaining the high readiness to be ready to defend our nation and to defend uh, to the last breath if needed. The civilians must understand also that they cannot escape the war and war find them wherever they will be. They have to be prepared. citizens should also be prepared for what may come. Many Estonian families have suitcases ready to go, containing bottled water, batteries and a loaf of bread. Men and women are ready to report to the so-called Defence League, a civilian militia that offers paramilitary training all over Estonia. Arbo and Mart met at university and became friends. One is now a filmmaker, the other started a tech company. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they both decided to join a civilian militia. Sünipäev on peetud, ommiku nii sai pressitud sõpradega ja nüüd olema jälle siin väravas. Ootan sõpru. Tegi peaks minu nüüd vastu võtma. Tegi, kas minu sõigus kaltsu kellegil üldse vaja on. Noh, läbi värjad nagu kassi vajad. Do you remember that morning of the 24th of February? Yeah, definitely. How did you experience it? was a horror. That? Yes, but it was uh, first, it was a party, Estonian independence yeah. party. Yeah. And uh, I didn't realize the real horror. It was party and celebration. I was, to be honest, pretty drunk. So I, it took one day 
Next day I woke up and then I understood what the heck is going on. Yeah, uh, Again. It was a shame. It was a true shame to be a human person mm -hmm. and to, to, to see that uh, what is going on. I even thought that it's the price we have to pay to be a human being. Uh, even though I've learned the history and there's a, it's a repetition and repetition, but there's still there was kind of humanistic belief uh, yeah. that we are we are gathered. better now. <laughs> but then, and then you have, it's like uh, spitting to yourself to the face or well, I don't know, uh, to accept that uh, there is no change, sorry one. But the reality, at least to me, is confirming that uh, better be prepared. A bit more than a year ago, I didn't even dream about that. I'm yeah, under arms, armors, uh, living and uh, practicing and tr training myself really to be a kill killing machine. A so, killing machine. And basically, if you are working with a machine gun, then you are a killing machine. If you can use the, it, and it's appropriately, it's a targeted, then it's uh, that's the aim. Because that's what you have been practicing. Yeah, right? yeah, that, 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 that's the whole point of it. That you are not just a kind of lamb in a situation where it's a war or you have to protect yourself. So you, you might have a great will, but if there is no tools, you are not knowing what to do, how to act, then you are nothing. But that's the reason also why I, I think at least me I was joining the Defence League. It was exactly to be organised, realising that the threat is not any more kind of illusion that may be something, but it's now a reality, our reality where we are living. And after Butch, uh, there is no illusions yeah. that uh, what the enemy could do with our wives and children. So that's, uh, we do not have any other options. So we have to protect ourselves and we know they will rape, kill, and that's an ordinary Russian war machine. So. Really, we don't have any illusions left. And even for in my case, I really was in a intelligent dreaming about that there is a 21st century and there is a kind of <laughs> process of uh, human being a human. But now the reality is very simple. Uh, that Russia is actually acting like uh, in a zoo, or you can follow in the nature as a predator in that meaning that as soon they sense weakness. They will attack. But do you really think you can pick up a gun and really kill someone? No? Yeah, no, I if do not. To. Yeah, I do not have any. But can you do it? Yeah, uh, pfft, it's now that's the thin ice. It's easy to say uh, I'm ready, I can. Uh, but uh, if you are, haven't been in a war, I think you can't actually uh, answer to those questions. Mm. But I feel that in case I'm forced to the situation. Uh, I do not have any obstacles to, to do my movement. To shoot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But still our superiors, they are totally honest, uh, telling us that we are cannon fodder. So they are throwing us uh, to the first uh, battle and we will, all of us could possibly die. Yeah, so that's the job there is no illusions. Yeah. Is that what they're telling you at this Yes, training? that's brutal honesty. Although the fighting that goes on every day in Ukraine seems far away to us, for some Estonians, the front line is awfully close. Johanna Maria Letma of Slava Ukraini works with a team of loyal volunteers to organize survival kits and relief supplies for civilians as well as the military. Their kits comprise ambulances, winter clothes, reconnaissance drones and camouflage materials which are all personally delivered by her in convoys reaching the bitterest areas of combat. Hi, man. Sit down. Talk about 
nagu Konstantin Ivkasse meil on raisad seal. Mis üles leiti nii-öelda poolt muutist ja toodi sinna, et saan stabi punktist kätte. Can you explain what has happened? So on Thursday, the 2nd of February, there was an attack on a humanitarian aid convoy in Bahmut. And um, one uh, international uh, worker got killed. Um, one Ukrainian died uh, and several uh, Norwegian uh, volunteers got injured. And one of our Estonian volunteers thankfully was unharmed and we're trying to figure out how to get him to Estonia. What was he doing, Bakhmut? Well, he was part of an ambulance team that was evacuating the wounded. So um, that was his job uh, for the past uh, few months. Otherwise, he was freelance helping the military. So he, we need to get him back to his family. <clears throat> of course, he was voluntarily, voluntarily, he went there to help the military. Mm, yes, but so do a lot of people from Estonia. So who is fighting in the Foreign Legion, who is uh, helping as a medic. So there are lots of people we just uh, the public uh, just don't know their names uh, and uh, the amount of people that are helping. But um, it's, um, it's a sizable amount of Estonians who have uh, actually given uh, their lives and, uh, and their, all of their resources to help Ukraine. Ja sihikindel naine, kes suutis tohutu kiirusega pärast seda, kui Venema tungis. Sisse Ukrainasse lükkada käima. MTÜ, Slava Ukraini, tõrõhtus Johanna Maria. Tõrõhtus. Before the Russian invasion, Johanna Maria worked for the biggest film festival in Estonia. But when the bombs began to fall, she immediately dropped everything to help her friends in Kyiv. Kas üldse on turvalist kohta seal? Kuidas inimesed seda seal seda ohtu tajuvad? Sa tegelikult ju kunagi ei tea, kuhu see raket lendab ja tui, 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 et, et mul on ka õnneks läinud. Et... On the 27th, of February 2022. I got a call from my former husband. Uh, he's Ukrainian. We used to live in Kiev. He said that the war has started and that they're escaping. And uh, he said that uh, they need an ambulance in Ukraine. And, um, and then I started watching the news and uh, calling my friends. Um, I was quite anxious. I remember that um, I was trying to hide from my daughter that I was going to the bathroom uh, quite a lot uh, to throw up. To throw up? Mm -hmm. And um, I was in shock. So I called um, one of our, my family friends, uh, Ilmar Rag, who, um, who is also um, in the Defence League here. And um, I asked, where do I get an ambulance? And uh, he wrote back on Facebook, like three hours later, I have the ambulance, who's the recipient on the other side. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and People then- People are so ready to help instantly. Yeah, and I think one of the main reasons that Slava Ukraini got such a start is largely because of this group of businessmen that immediately started helping out with money, with fundraising, with purchasing the ambulances. And they helped us also with this warehouse. They only made one call. It's not only citizens who are ready to help. Many Estonian entrepreneurs also became active from the first day of the war, raising funds in any way they could to buy relief supplies. In everyday life, Ragnar Sass is a successful internet entrepreneur and angel investor with businesses all over the world. When war broke out in Ukraine, he sprang into action immediately. 24th of February is Estonian Independence Day. That is like the most crazy thing ever. But it was extreme shock. And in the first day of shock, second day I, I found that you can donate money to the Ukraine army. Many Estonian entrepreneurs joined that. So we were donating money to Ukraine army in Germany. 
And then we looked what we can do. And after a few weeks, uh, we got information that one of the most biggest thing what we need is cars. Because some of my local team friends, the car just like broke up when he was under the fire. He survived, but you can imagine you were driving, so shooting at you, and this car is just so bad, stopped. So I bought the first Toyota Hilux. Because many of those cars are used literally saving lives. Because um, if you think about the wars and you have a zero line, then sadly so many people are getting wounded. And there is no ambulance on that. And sadly, there is not enough armor. So they're using those cars, taking wounded people, moving at least four or five kilometers. And then you have ambulance which is taking test to the nearest hospital. So many cars are used for that, that thing. Uh, so literally, there are people who are writing, thank you, all the volunteers you helped to save my life. This is how difficult is the roads in Ukraine, and this is why we need to send much better cars, because they will get stuck and so on. This is in the Donbass. So yeah, it's uh, much worse than people imagine the situation. Or like, this is Kremina, exactly. There was one Ukrainian who received car and he recorded video in Estonian language, showing his gratitude. But this is the guy. This is... This guy learned Estonian, just basically sent the video and they said, this is, and he said that you're my friend now. So we have sent now 128 cars, 11 uh, different convoys. We have also driving one from London. It was 45 hours nine from Sweden, which we bought, and one from Finland. And these are also uh, your colleagues who are helping you? Yeah, this is my good friends from Finland, and they have been helping to buy, I think, that now seven or eight cars. And they are joining next convoy. So, so you brought in cars from Finland? Uh, so I run a small investment firm, and I have clients who have been very generous, who have uh, so I've done quite a lot of fundraising, and. So they've made donation to this cause to support it, and uh, with that we've bought quite many cars. I've myself taken care of more of the fundraising part, and then Ragnar and his crew have taken care of buying the cars. So you are the fundraiser in Finland? Uh, most of my clients actually happen to be in the US, so ah. mo I've been mostly fundraising there. So it's a truly international network then that you are spreading yes. out. Yes, it is, yeah. From Estonia to Finland, from Finland to the US? Yes, and we actually even have two of these American guys who've made large donations joining us on the next convoy. Oh, they so, come over? So they're flying from all the way from the States to here to Tallinn, and then they are driving with us to Kiev. And you are actually driving in person? Yes, as well, yeah. The convoy yeah. as well. Uh, is this your first time or have you been there? It, it's going to be my third time. I was third twice time. last year, yeah. Are you doing it together? Uh, for me, it's going to be my first time. I'm his brother. So and you're I'm joining him? Going to join for the next convoy, yeah. And you're not afraid to go in? I'm not afraid to go in, no. Because uh, things might happen. Things might happen, but uh, I'm confident that it's gonna gonna go well, and I'm very happy to to come and donate those cars and help Ukraine. He is a bit uh, shy and he cries. Why is it? that the Estonians and the Finns are so proactive in sending goods to a front that is just as far from them as it is from us. From the Estonian capital Tallinn, it's about a 38-hour drive, if you keep going steadily. The distance from the Netherlands is about the same. None of this matters to Johanna Maria. She makes the trip regularly in one of her vans, right up to the front line 
in a besieged Bakhmut. I stay two weeks here in Thailand um, because I have a small daughter here and she also needs her mother and uh, two or two and a half weeks I'm in Ukraine. So uh, I cross the border, we immediately take our cars and our convoy from Lviv and then we go straight to Dnipro. In Dnipro we have to day pack our next day's cars and then we go off again. We start at four or five o'clock in the morning because in order to drive to Bahmut, it's about six hours. One workday is about 18 uh, to 21 hours. We try to, uh, to work also three days, but it's too um, dangerous for us also because the drivers can get tired. Yeah. And uh, it's also the emotional side. When you are under constant shelling, you know, you have to uh, give yourself a mental break. It's, uh, it's not easy. Next to the wall. People may think that when area is deoccupied, everything goes back to normal. It's not that. Homes are destroyed, people are killed, there's no infrastructure left, there's no gas, electricity and so on. So normal life is nowhere to be found. And then we stay on the ground uh, as little as possible because the civilians are in basements basically how it works is that we go into this portal of houses uh, and uh, we honk we know exactly where to go we signal them uh, and then they come out uh, like little mice most of the people uh, still live in cellars it's very dark it's uh, humid people are, uh, get all kinds of diseases. Then there you be kind of become like a psychologist also because these people have no one to talk to. So they tell you their stories and it's, um, let's be honest, it's quite hard to listen, Yeah. but that's our job, uh, to help them as much as possible. And this is a flag um, the 115th uh, Battalion uh, gave uh, to us. Uh, they are originally from Melitopol, uh, which is under occupation, and uh, from Melitopol comes uh, cherries. Cherries? Yes. Herson is for watermelons, Melitopol oh, yeah. uh, is for cherries, Great. the sweetest cherries in the world. Oh, yeah. And it's under occupation, of course. And uh, the guys have written um, together until victory. And uh, thank you, Diakou. Who were these guys who were giving this to you? Were they, they, can you tell a bit about this battalion? Uh, I can't tell uh, where they are fighting. They are still on the front line. Um, but uh, this is a group that we met through a friend in spring. We went to their base. They have two sides. They have artillery 
and they have also drones. They're very good in drones. Uh, we put them together with other units also so they can uh, share intelligence and um, <clears throat> share knowledge how to fly better and how to um, keep off uh, Russian raiders uh, when they're flying. So they're doing a very, very good job and um, it's always very good to see them. Oh, oh. <laughs> They're really great guys. They're one of our closest uh, groups, and uh, and um, with them we have no um, no doubt that uh, the aid goes into the right place. <laughs> Розкажу про любов, душа страждає, з дух тримбіти лунає, а що серце кохає, Бога яче мов жар. It's always very good to see them, but uh, it's with actually all, all of the group, so some of the guys are you're more closer to, uh, but... Um, it's the pluses and minuses. The closer you are, the, um, the harder it is for you to process if they're injured or if they uh, die. I have been to uh, quite a few um, funerals. The last one was last week. And uh, I think uh, Vitali's death um, kind of um, kind of released uh, all of the emotions that I had um, gathered uh, this past year. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, um, when I got to his um, sending off in the cathedral and uh, there I somehow managed to keep myself intact. But then when I got back to, uh, back to the hotel, um, Let's be honest, I, uh, I cried for six hours straight and the next morning there was a funeral, so it's not, very, it's not a very easy job and I wouldn't um, wish this job uh, for anyone. It's uh, very rewarding that you get to help people, but uh, the losses uh, weigh you down uh, quite a bit, let's say. And what, what happened to Vitali? Mm, he was a member of the 80th Brigade. Mm, they are the Saint Nikki, and um, and they went to um, uh, went on a counter attack. Mm, somehow their location was given up. He wasn't even uh, supposed to be on that mission, but one of the guys dropped out, uh, and um, they were so close to the Russians that um, he got shot. Um, he Sorry, it's okay. It's okay. He got he got shot. And uh, he managed to say on the radio that he's um 300, uh, which means he's wounded. But but the time he they got to him, he was already dead. He bled to death. Um, but thankfully, he, they got his body, yeah. and um, there were nine of them. Uh, Vitali was dead, uh, so were five others, and they couldn't retrieve one body, so... So these are the things we have to deal with also in, in this job, because it's not only the military that dies, uh, it's, it's our friends. And I think his death uh, came and brought up uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of deaths that have been among my friends. And uh, some of my family members have uh, died. I haven't uh, wanted to think about them, but uh, his death did something. And I think there's a limit to every person of what you can take, and then you kind of break for a second. Yeah. 
And I think Vitalis did that to me. If anyone was sounding the alarm about the danger from Russia, it was Kaya Kalas, Estonia's Prime Minister. We run into her while she's campaigning in Tallinn on a quiet Sunday morning. Is there anything you would like to say to Western Europe? Um, well, what is important is to understand that what is at stake here. Uh, it is uh, the question of the rules-based order. And what we are afraid of is that uh, when the Iron Curtain was there, um, the Western world didn't really miss us. <laughs> But uh, we were suffering a great deal and we are part of the Western world and, uh, and we don't want to be forgotten this time. I mean, uh, because it was very hard times that we were living through. And uh, considering that we were 50 years occupied, uh, we had to make so many big efforts to be where we are right now. I mean, in terms of GDP, in terms of well-being of our people, economy. I mean, you had the growth all the time. We had to do a very huge leap. Uh, we don't want to lose it all again. And uh, Russia is acting in a, in a very aggressive manner, which means that uh, the threat is there. But I'm, I'm not sure if, if uh, all of the Western friends really understand uh, this. If you take war and peace, it's so black and white. But there's also a difference between peace and peace. I mean, we had peace after the Second World War, as, uh, as did the Western countries, whereas peace uh, on, on one side of the Iron Curtain meant, uh, you know, all the prosperity that you have, whereas for our side of the Iron Curtain, it meant uh, erasing the elite, killing, uh, uh, you know, the... Um, creative people, killing uh, the political elite, military elite, erasing our culture, uh, our language. No freedom? Uh, no freedom, not, nothing. Uh, so, so that was our side of peace. And this is the same that will happen uh, for the occupied territories in, in Ukraine. So that's what you're afraid of? Yeah. Uh, and if, if it pays off, then actually uh, the next uh, step will be bigger every time. Imagine how your whole life changes in moments and everything you've worked for and all the freedoms you've achieved are suddenly yanked away from you. A year ago, before the 24th of February, what did you, your life look like? Party. <laughs> it was a settled on family business, leisures, hobbies, uh, and no such a permanent uh, feeling of horror. And uh, the 24th of February just changed dramatically the understanding and then also the philosophical sense of the meaning that I might be a Buddhist or those values of Buddhism are important. I might be a pacifist saying that it's the, that's the worst. What mm. we can imagine is to kill somebody for in, in a conflict or of mm -hmm. argumentation or whatever. But now I don't have any kind of, uh, it changed my uh, something inside me very significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. And uh, uh, I'm 51 now. Mm -hmm. So I think it, I could die uh, easily protecting or my, my country. Uh, because we know exactly what Russians are doing with uh, National Guard uh, members, families. You are first targets for them. They will kill you and your family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you used to be pacifist before? Yes. Uh, I'm still, I might say. <laughs> Me too. I'm very yeah, yeah, pacifist. Now aggressive, uh, passive militarist in that meaning. That it haven't changed my inner approach, but the, re it's the reason is, as Arbo also explained, that in... Uh, in kind of such a, let's say, tense periods we are living, you have to choose your part or inside. What do you do? What is the acting models of your next steps? And I really evaluate the freedom. I've been a part of the USSR almost half of my life. I definitely do not want to get that back. 
definitely. I do not want a repetition of a uh, uh, situation of uh, before the Second World War of uh, 39, where we basically were forced to give up away our freedom. And that's why I'm saying not today, yeah, not nowadays. Not this time yeah. anymore. And there is a very simple question. Are you ready to, to stand mm. for, for that or not? And that makes actually one plus one and plus plus depends. Do we evaluate our freedom enough to stand and say we can protect it? And it's what do you simple. mean by freedom? <laughs> to live in an independent uh, um, uh, Estonian uh, Republic uh, in EU. That is on a draft for us. Yeah, that's, yeah that's because it. during Soviet time, everything was a lie. Mm. Everything. The, the newspaper was a total lie. And, uh, television, like it is in uh, today's Russia. So they returned uh, the wheel of history back to the Soviet time. And we do not want to uh, participate in this circus anymore. History repeats itself. That's clearly shown here in Narva. The town has a fraught past. At the end of World War II, Narva was razed to the ground by Russian forces. When it was rebuilt, its original population had to make way for newly imported people from Russia. Narva became a kind of Russian enclave on Estonian territory. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, these ethnic Russians got stuck between a rock and a hard place. Officially, they're Estonian citizens, but in their hearts, they're Russian. This is Nikita. His family came from Russia to Narva three generations ago. He himself is of the younger generation and feels much more Estonian than Russian. This is why he joined the Narva civilian militia as a volunteer. Today, he and his brigade celebrate the liberation of Estonia in 1920, when his country first shook off the Russian yoke. Super. Я поступил в Кайцелит около двух с половиной лет назад, и для меня это саморазвитие. Я учусь выживать на дикой природе, учусь пользоваться оружием, быстро комплектовать какие-то снаряжения, наборы. Ну, если сравнивать, с чего мы с вами начинали, in his daily life, Nikita works as a physiotherapist at the hospital in Narva. But on weekends, he's on standby to defend Estonia should the Russians ever invade. Ты себя чувствуешь кем? Русским, эстонцем, эстонским русским, русскоговорящим эстонцем? Кто ты? Русскоговорящий эстонец, да. Рос в русской семье, ну то есть вообще мы по большей части все-таки украинцы, чем русские. Просто так получилось, что поскольку приезжали в Россию еще мои предки, то получилось так, что ну, кровь слилась в одну. Если это перейдет в мировой масштаб, мы, мы прекрасно понимаем, что это может случиться. Здесь будет военный полигон, не здесь мы стоим. Потому что мы на границе, да? Да. Ну и сюда все стягивают, оружие и так далее. Угу. Но, если честно, как бы, ну, состояние у всех напряженное. Мы надеемся просто, что этого не произойдет. Баба переживала, а папа нет. Это потому, что когда 
бо я сім'я переїжджала в Естонію. Папа уїхав на заробітки в Росію на кілька років і служив там в армії. Можливо, тому вона стала к нему більш тісно зв'язана з ним, Росія, і тому він яро підтримує саме Росію. Ну, мой папа объясняет точно так же, как объясняли российские власти во время начала конфликта, что это спецоперация по удалению нацизма из Украины. Поэтому он поддерживает Россию. Он считает, что это правда. Мы все бросили, я осталась. Ну, он политически тебе не говорит. Вообще. Вообще абсолютно. Мы все не Есть причина какая-то, да? Нет, это просто Нет, залог да. хороших отношений. Да, чтобы не перессориться все. Поэтому когда-то, может быть, и обсудили, ну так, быстро, вскользь, а теперь да, мы избегаем этих тем. Я знаю, что Молодежь, вплоть до разводов у дяди да. Вити Вика разводится с мужем, потому что у них разные взгляды. Она, видите ли, из русских корней, племянница моя. Распалась семья. Вообще, я даже новости не хочу слушать. Просто ну, аполитично. Включаешь, не хочу. Надо. Смотрите, телевизор, а кстати, а что вообще сейчас можно, что, что вы смотрите, какие ну, новости, откуда? Европейские. Какие, Это вы плюс. Да. Эстонские каналы. Ну, да. конечно. Других не показывают. Ну, люди в интернете смотрят. В интернете, пожалуйста. Ну, вы можете сравнить, что говорят в России, а что в Эстонии как-то? Ну, честно скажу, и те, и другие врут. А откуда тогда нам а... взять более... Они непонятно, где правда. А это да. надо в окоп сесть. И тогда посмотреть, где будет правильно, а где будет неправильно. Не знаю даже, правда, не знаю, где правда. Поэтому мы не поднимаем эти темы, потому что это настолько сложно. Если Россия пойдет войной на историю, то, разумеется, мы будем ее защищать. Все-таки я вырос здесь. Здесь мой дом. И я буду готов защищать его до самого последнего. Что надо будет стрелять. Получается, русскоговорящий стреляет в русскоговорящих. То есть, можно сказать, мы братья. Да. Но я с этим абсолютно спокоен. Exactly one year after Putin invaded Ukraine, the Estonians meet up in the central square in Tallinn to celebrate their Independence Day with a military parade. And filmmaker Arbo, despite being a pacifist, has made his choice. <laughs> Many people maybe don't want to realize, but uh, it's uh, Ukrainians are not only fighting for their freedom, uh, they are fighting for all of Europe's freedom. And um, if people can't comprehend that, uh, why we are doing this, why we are constantly willing to risk our lives, then um, I think we have a bit of a problem on our hands. So people can't get tired of this war. We still have to donate, we have to make these uh, nets, so everyone needs to pitch in and do their part in order for us to win this war. All the aggressors in the world are taking notes very clearly. I mean, look at China, for watching. example. And watching very clearly. If nothing happens, yeah. then, you know, okay, this pays off, and, and all the countries who are neighbors of such countries are, are in danger. So we should also Think about this. We should all think about this, not only in the European region, but everywhere. Where do you draw the line? If Putin were to march on Berlin and beyond? Or is this our war already? Because we support Ukraine.